Hi, I'm Sadashiva Pai from uh, Science Mission. Uh, today we have uh, uh, Dr. Kelly McNagney, professor in uh, medical genetics at the Biomedical Research Center, where his work focuses on stem cell behavior, innate immune responses, inflammatory disease, cancer biology, and therapeutics. In 2015, he also served as a scientific director of the Center for Drug Research and Development, a national center for excellence aimed at translating early stage scientific discoveries into therapies. He has garnered several awards, including the 2004 Chevelle Pfizer Junior Faculty Award from the American Association of Immunology, Kelly Phillips leadership role in Canadian Stem Cell Network Center of Excellence, and is the Associate Director of Canadian Allergen Network Center of Excellence and Co-Director of its Biomarkers and Bioinformatics Platform. Uh, welcome, Dr. McNagney, to Science Hangout. Thank you. So can you talk about yourself, your background, your education, your uh, some of the previous work you have done? Sure. So I, I got an <clears throat> undergraduate degree in biology and biotechnology from an engineering uh -huh. school, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And then I went to graduate school in Birmingham, Alabama with a, a, my post, my graduate advisor was Max Cooper, a B-cell immunologist, very, very famous and popular. Um, uh -huh. I worked on B-cell development there and then shortly thereafter went to Heidelberg, Germany to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the Euro European Molecular Biology Labs with uh, okay. Thomas Graf, who's a, a well-known person in transcription factors that guide hematopoietic cell differentiation. And okay. then there I was working on uh, cell fate and how to control uh, differentiation of hematopoietic stem cells and worked on a family of proteins called the CD34 family. Um, I then took that work and, and started my own lab at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver at the Biomedical okay. Research Center, and that's really what I've been working on ever since. Okay, so tell me about your lab, lab people. Sure, so yeah, uh, we have a, a, a medium-sized lab. Uh, we have two postdoctoral fellows, uh, four graduate students, and then always have at least two or three undergraduates working in the lab as well. Um, <clears throat> the lab is fairly diverse. Most work on cellular immunology, but also a bit of cancer work, <clears throat> some work in allergy. I would say mm -hmm. if you wanted to sum everything up, <clears throat> it would be uh, we develop animal models for human disease and then look at mutations that influence the outcome of those diseases and try to figure out therapies that would be benefit to, to people. Okay. And... Uh... You know, the research is always ups and downs. So how do you motivate uh, your uh, uh, students to always up and uh, running and uh, not to lose their uh, <laughs> cool sometimes? That, that can be challenging. Every student is different and you, you have to figure out what makes them tick and what motivates them. Um, uh -huh. my, my general approach is actually to let them have a lot of uh, liberty in, in guiding their projects. So I usually okay. start out students and say, okay, try these two or three projects, mm -hmm. um, see how it goes. Uh, I always put pair them with a more senior person in the lab for the first few months so that they can kind of get the skill sets they need. Uh -huh. And then as quickly as possible, I let them start to solo and work on their own. And okay. I do that not to leave them uh, blank and by themselves, but more because I find when they get to work on their own, they get to develop their own projects, they work much harder than if I come in every day and say, today you will do this experiment, then you will tell me the result, and tomorrow you will do that experiment. I if I do that, then it becomes my project, not theirs, and I find that they're much more motivated if it's their own project and they get excited and run into my office and tell me a result. So that's, that's the general approach. Um, Okay. I always try to give them a very safe project, one that's that will easily get them a publication, and then a very unsafe project, which is more challenging. Mm -hmm. But if it works, will give them a will revolutionize the way we think about a certain disease aspect. So I make sure that they don't okay. fall 
but I also give them the opportunity to fly. Okay, it's a good approach, I would say. And uh, talk to me about your uh, philosophy of uh, mentoring. Like, uh, how do you mentor the people and how you have been mentored also? Yeah, so um, I think I've always been mentored as, as a colleague rather than a student. And I think as a graduate student, really what you're doing is you're learning to take control of your own education. You're learning to become the perpetual student who trains themselves. And so what I try to do is very quickly teach students to behave as a colleague, to come with me with questions, to brainstorm, to share ideas. And we each correct each other when we have misinformation or false ideas. And I find that if you use that approach, um, they become very mature very quickly and they become very good at, at, at guiding their own development. And I really think that's the goal at a graduate student level is to really train you to become an independent investigator. So I, I provide them with the resources and the opportunity and the rest is up to them. Okay, that's good. And uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, other than uh, research like Tell me about your hobbies. What do you do other than research during your free time? Oh, uh, so I, I like playing guitar. I, oh, wow. I have a band of aged professors. And okay. What we lack in skill, we make up for with enthusiasm. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we, we enjoy playing music together. A, a bunch of old professors, drummer, bass, guitarist, uh -huh. singer. Um, okay. That's one thing that we do. I, I practice karate as well. So I got a black belt yeah. when I was 16, and so I continued that. And yeah. then um, my wife and I and my kids have a small cottage on an island just off the coast of Vancouver that mm -hmm. whenever we can, we retreat to and, and do gardening and watch the wildlife. So that, that those are the things that keep me occupied outside of the lab. Good. So coming back to the lab again, uh, what made you get into stem cell? What interested you to get into stem cells and uh, the cancer? What was your inspiration to get into that kind of subject? Yeah, it was a, a curiosity and serendipity, actually. So um, I, I, okay. as I mentioned, that during my PhD, I worked on B cell differentiation and had been working with a lot of cell lines, which um, taught us about B cell differentiation. And I wanted to go further back in the in the hierarchy and look at the earlier cells, the cells that contributed okay. to all that differentiation. And I was lucky enough to link up with a postdoc advisor who had developed a new system for culturing um, clones of stem cells um, that were temperature mm -hmm. sensitive. And you could, just by shifting the temperature of these cells, inactivate the genes that had frozen them and then watch okay. differentiation take place in a wave in vitro. And I found that fascinating. And that got me into looking more and more at, at, at normal cells and how they differentiate during development. So that's where things started. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we cloned this family of markers of blood stem cells. And uh, studying stem cells is difficult, but looking at gene knockouts for each one of those family members of the genes, we started to get phenotypes in a variety of different tissues. And, by following our nose and tracking down how those mutations influenced immune response, um, stem cell development, we learned a lot about the biology behind how stem cells maintain this potency, but then can differentiate into a variety of different tissues. Okay. So that's how things started. As luck would have it, one of those genes seemed to be really involved in development of, of cells involved in allergic responses and antiparasitic responses. That's what got us into chronic inflammation. Another one of the genes uh, was dramatically upregulated in cancer. And we started studying its role in cancer and found that it actually um, was involved in rapid tumor progression um, and always marked the most metastatic and lethal cancers. And so knowing that we developed antibodies against that particular protein and are trying to use those to treat metastatic disease now. So okay. just a matter of following your nose and, and letting the, the science guide you where it will. Okay, yeah, like from stem cells to cancer, inflammation, everything. So what are you going to present today? Uh, today I'll tell you a little bit more about the chronic inflammatory disease work. Okay. So um, we began looking at uh, allergic disease and um, 
I was collaborating with a, a, someone who had identified a new cell type in lung uh, called innate lymphoid cells. And these are a newly discovered set of lymphocytes um, that make all the same growth factors as T cells, but they lack antigen-specific receptors. So they're a type of innate cell that makes the same kind of responses as T cells and guides the right allergic and inflammatory responses. And kind of an age-old question has been, you know, when you make a response to a parasite versus a bacteria or a virus, how, how does your immune system know to do that? How do they know to make an adaptive response to that particular pathogen if it's the first time you've ever seen it? And the answer is these innate lymphoid cells are what guide that. So I'll tell you about a transcription factor that we identified that guides that response. And I'll tell you how studying that we've learned a little bit about chronic inflammation and disease. Okay. So that but transcription factor is called Rural Alpha. Okay. And the way this work began is uh, we first started looking at so I'm just moving the slides forward for you. I, I, I first you need to share them. Oh, sorry. How do we go about that? Uh, just on the left side, top oh, gotcha. screen yep. share. There we go. So, so what I'm talking about is a transcription factor called Roar Alpha uh, that's uh -huh. expressed in the innate lymphoid cells and how that plays a role in acute airway inflammation. D did you share uh, the screen, whole screen? Because I see all the background in there. Uh, sharing the whole screen, we do. One thing you can do is just get out of it and come back. How's that? OK, now it is good. Excellent. So I'll first tell you a little bit about how Roar Alpha is involved in innate lymphoid cell development, and that plays out in, in lung acute allergic disease. Mm -hmm. um, then I'll tell you about a different role it plays in innate lymphoid cells and intestinal fibrosis with chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And then finally, a little bit about how that gene also um, guides cell fate and differentiation. Mm -hmm. So the work starts with, again, this collaborator. We were he identified a subset of cells in lung mm -hmm. that um, looked a lot like stem cells, but found that they made these T cell cytokines that seemed to be involved in inflammatory response. It was a cell type that didn't make any sense by our current mm -hmm. understanding of how cells differentiate. Um, and to make a long story short, those are innate lymphoid cells. We gene profiled them and found that those cells tend to make a transcription factor called Roar Alpha. Mm -hmm. And that was only expressed in these natural helper cells. It was not expressed in any other cell types we found in lung. Now, as luck would have it, there was a tra already a mouse that had a mutation in that gene. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the gene is called Roar Alpha staggerer mice. These are called staggerer mice because they have some neurological defects that make them walk unsteadily. Um, they have uh, developmental defects. But if you look at the blood system of those mice, the one thing that they lack is these innate lymphoid cells type 2. So what we began doing is taking the bone marrow from those mice and transplanting it into wild type mice. Mm -hmm. And now we have a chimeric mouse, which has normal development, nor neuro normal neurological function, but selectively lacks that, trans that cell type, the innate lymphoid cells type 2. And we took those mice and analyzed them for allergic disease. And here are three different models we use for looking at allergic disease in mice. One is the house dust mite model. So house dust mite is an allergen that 85% of people who have allergies will be allergic to. Um, what we do with mice is we spray that allergen into their nose as a priming phase. Then we wait two weeks, and then we challenge them intranasally with the same antigen, and they develop allergies just like people. So that's one model. A second model we used is an ovalbumin model. This is a different model where we take a chicken egg white protein. We inject that intraperitoneally in the mice to make them primed, and then we challenge them again intranasally and develop allergies against that protein. The difference between these two models is one is 
the natural route of, of priming through the nose. This mm -hmm. other one is intraperitoneal. It's a systemic priming. And we wanted to look at the role of these innate lymphoid cells in these two different models. The third model is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is not a Th2 disease. It's a Th17 driven lung inflammation. Very different from asthma, but also a lung inflammatory disease. And the goal is to find out what these innate lymphoid cells do in each one of these models. Okay. So here's just a quick overview of what you see. If you make mice allergic to this house dust mite, wild type mice, you can see in this section of lung, have lots of inflammatory infiltrates. Mm -hmm. uh, all along the airways, they get lots of inflammation. <coughs> Around the blood vessels, they get inflammation. Um, this is what allergy would look like in a human lung. Um, if you look at the rural alpha knockout mice, the ones that lack ILC2s, you can see their lung looks like it's in much better shape. They have much less inflammation, none of the inflammatory infiltrates in the small airways, and only a little bit of inflammation in the larger airways. So it looks like these ILC2s are responsible for driving inflammation, and if you take them away, you dampen inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, this is just looking at cell counts, uh, the cells that migrate to the lung in response to that allergen. And if you look at the raw alpha knockouts, they have about a third the amount of inflammation of wild type mice. And the main thing they're lacking is eosinophils, these cells that drive the inflammation and remodeling of lung. In addition, uh, IgE is an immunoglobulin that's made in response to allergens. And you can see that that's way down in these mice as well. So not only are they protected from inflammation, they also don't make antibodies against the allergen, and so they're really protected from allergy. These are some cytokines that typically you find in the lung in response to inflammation, so interleukin-4, interleukin-5, always come up with airway inflammation in allergic disease, IL-17 as well. And as you can see, those are all down in the knockout mice, so they're failing to make an adaptive immune response to this allergen. Now, that tells us that those cells are critical for making an allergic response in response to intranasal priming and challenge. Mm -hmm. What happens if you do systemic priming using that other model, the old albumin model? Mm -hmm. Well, if you do that, you inject intraperitoneally with the antigen, now you get exactly the same allergic disease as you would get in wild-type mice. You get the same amount of inflammation in the lung, and you recover the IgE. Mm. If you look at the cytokines produced, they recover the IL-5, and we have also finally recovered the IL-4 and 13. But they lack IL-17, this TH17 cell cytokine, which is a different type of immune response. So what that tells us is that the innate lymphoid cells are critical for um, intranasal priming and challenge, but they're dispensable for allergies in this other model. So just as a quick summary, this is what we found. In response to allergens, normally what happens is you breathe in an allergen. It, uh, it, most allergens are proteases. They damage the epithelia in the lung. That causes the release of alarmins or signaling molecules that tell you that there's an inflammatory um, insult. These innate lymphoid cells type 2 produce IL-5 and 13, which recruit in eosinophils and dendritic cells. The eosinophils immediately start causing those responses that you associate with allergy. The dendritic cells pick up that antigen. They take it to the draining lymph node. They prime T cells. The T cells then migrate back into the lung, and now you are permanently allergic. In the absence of these innate lymphoid cells, none of that happens. The eosinophils are not recruited in. The dendritic cells don't migrate to the lung. You don't stimulate that response, and then you're protected from allergies. So that told us that those cells are critical for an acute inflammatory response and priming allergies. We then wanted to look at something um, different, a chronic inflammatory disease. And in this case, we decided to look at tissue fibrosis. And that's important because I would argue that all of us, um, if we don't die from cancer or infection, will eventually die from fibrotic disease. 
as you age, your liver starts to lose its function, your kidneys start to lose function, the normal tissue is replaced with extracellular matrix and your organs start to slowly fail. That happens with age. It also happens if you get chronic inflammation of the tissues. Um, so we wanted to see if these innate lymphoid cells play any role in, in perpetuation of fibrotic disease. And we switched now to not looking at lung, but looking at a, at a gut model. And we used a salmonella-driven model of inflammation. So the model looks like this. We take mice and we first treat them with a bit of streptomycin. That clears out some of the normal bacteria in the gut. And then a day later, we give them a very mild strain of salmonella that causes chronic inflammation in the gut. Um, this is an attenuated strain. It's a vaccine grade of salmonella. It doesn't kill the mice, but it does induce a wave of inflammation. Um, over the next three weeks, the mice clear that infection. But then what you see is uh, de deposition of matrix and fibrosis of the gut. And just to show you what that looks like, if you look on the uh, top panel, you'll see what the gut of the mouse looks like normally. This is nice epithelial layers in the gut, nice submucosa and muscle. Here's what happens 21 days after you infect them with salmonella. So you get this huge inflammation in the gut and you see lots of extracellular matrix de deposited throughout all layers of the gut. This actually looks like the kind of matrix you get deposited in a patient with Crohn's disease, a, a disease that causes tissue fibrosis in the gut. There's no treatment for it. Really, the only treatment is to surgically remove the section of gut that has the fibrosis and hope it goes away. Unfortunately, in most patients with Crohn's disease, it doesn't go away. So this is a, a great model of Crohn's disease. So we ran every mouse strain we have in my lab through this model, including the rural alpha knockout mice, and looked at inflammation. Now, if you look at the rural alpha knockouts, the first thing you notice if you look at the cecum or the spleen or the colon, you have equal numbers of salmonella in all of those tissues. So the mice have equal responses to the salmonella, whether they have those innate lymphoid cells in rural alpha or not. But then if you look at the matrix deposition and the fibrosis, it's night and day. So wild type mice over time, you see some matrix deposition at day seven, at day 21, and at day 35. If you look at the raw alpha knockouts, you get some matrix deposition at day seven, but then it starts to stop. And at day 21, they look much better than the wild type mice. And by th day 35, it's night and day. They really have virtually no matrix deposition compared to wild type. So that tells us that in the absence of these innate lymphoid cells, you get more matrix, you, you, you're protected from fibrosis of the gut. This just shows it in a prettier picture. This red stain is collagen staining in the gut. These are wild type mice, lots of matrix deposition and fibrosis. And in the Roar alpha knockouts, very, very little. If you look at inflammatory markers, those are way down in the Roar alpha knockouts, so they make less TGF beta and less collagen 1A. Interestingly enough, um, if you look at the Th2 cytokines, you see actually they're the same in these mouse strains. So although there is a little bit less Th2 cytokine in the Roar alpha knockouts, these levels are actually lower than they are in the uninfected mice. We went on to look at eosinophils and whether they're driving the fibrosis in this model, and the answer is actually no, they're not. So these double gata mice lack all eosinophils. You can see that they get the same amount of inflammation as wild type mice. To make sure that this wasn't a Th2 driven disease, we actually looked at STAT6 knockout mice. And you can see that they get, a, STAT6 is downstream of all Th2 cytokine signaling. If you knock out STAT6, um, you're completely protected from Th2 disease. But you see in these mice, we get exactly the same a level of fibrosis. So Roar alpha is playing a role, but it's not working through Th2 cytokines. So we looked further at more cytokines in these mice. We found that IL-6 was way down, the TNF was way down, IL-22 and IL-17 were way down in these mice. 
These are Th17 cytokines, and they are also expressed in innate lymphoid cells type 3, ILC3s. So trying to put all this data together and figure out what was going on and why these mice were protected, we learned something new about Roar Alpha. So there are two transcription factors. One is called Roar Alpha, and one is called Roar Gamma. They're very closely related. Roar Gamma is expressed in Th17 cells and ILC3s. Roar Alpha is expressed in those cells plus ILC2s. We already knew that if you take away Roar Alpha, you lose all ILC2s, but the ILC3s and the Th17 cells are still there. But what we didn't know is whether those cells are still functional in these knockout mice. And that's what we analyzed next. As it turns out, if you look at the ILC3s, even though the cells are there in these mice, they fail to make this Th17 cytokine IL-17. Same is true from the T cells. They fail to make IL-17. So yes, the cells are there, but they're dysfunctional. So if that's true, and if IL-17 is what's really driving the fibrosis of the gut, we thought that maybe if we used an antibody to IL-17, we could dampen fibrosis. And that's indeed the case. Here we show you what happens if you take those salmonella-infected mice and treat them with a control antibody. And here's what happens if you treat them with an antibody to IL-17. You can see the inflammation is way down, the matrix deposition is way down, and the gut epithelia looks quite good. So ILC3s and IL-17 are what's driving the fibrosis in this Crohn's disease model. And if you manage to treat patients with Crohn's disease with anti-IL-17, you'll probably be able to help them and prevent that fibrosis. Um, as I mentioned, IL-22 was also lower in those knockout mice, so we tried to look and see whether IL-22 uh, depletion would make them do better. Turns out that doesn't help them at all. It actually makes them much worse. So I think if you were to treat a patient with Crohn's disease with anti-IL-17, but then also give them recombinant IL-22, you might be able to help them with their disease and prevent fibrosis of the gut. So a quick summary of what I've shown you is that in this chronic fibrosis model, salmonella drives intestinal fibrosis, looks for all the world like Crohn's disease. The Roar Alpha knockout mice are protected from that fibrosis. I've also shown you that the, the Roar Alpha knockouts fail to make um, IL-17, this Th17 cytokine. It seems to be the major driver of fibrosis in this Crohn's disease model. What I didn't show you is that seems to be selectively produced by the ILC3s. And finally, really the take-home message is that if you had a way of inhibiting Roar Alpha function, um, you could probably dampen fibrosis and, and chronic inflammation in those patients with Crohn's disease. So I think that's a pretty good summary of just one aspect of the work we work on. That's the, a little bit of the chronic inflammation. We're looking at a whole bunch of other fibrotic diseases like muscular dystrophy. That's a, actually a fibrotic disease. We're looking at kidney fibrosis, which leads to kidney failure in, in patients with um, diabetic nephropathy and a variety of other kidney diseases. Um, we're trying to sort out whether these innate lymphoid cells are playing roles in tissue remodeling and tissue repair. Okay. And I think I can stop there and be happy to take any questions or tell you about other projects we have ongoing in the lab. Okay. Uh, if you can uh, just go to the same share, unshare it, that would be good. Double yeah. click on the share. So, oops. Here you go. There we go. Thank you very much. It's, it was pretty good. Uh, so like I have a couple of questions on this. Please. Uh, one of them is like there is a lot of uh, it's an excellent work so I don't have to really question your uh, work per se but uh, some of the things like I have been seeing recently a lot of work implicating microbiome in all this uh, inflammation and all those things 
So have you looked into in your model anything related? Because I've seen in, initially you have injected some antibiotics and all to get rid of some of the microbiome and all. Yeah. So ha have you looked in those terms? It, it's a great question. And I, I'm absolutely sure that the microbiome does play a role in chronic inflammation in the gut. Um, we also did a lot of the very early work showing that the microbiome in newborns plays a huge role in whether you're going to develop allergic disease or not. Um, we found that if you treat mice with very low dose antibiotics, you can make them incredibly susceptible to developing allergies later. Um, and that also fits with a lot of clinical data. Kids who below the age of two get multiple doses of antibiotics okay. are much more likely to develop allergies, and that's definitely driven by the microbiome. Um, and we have a lot of insight into how that gets, how that develops. Turns out that um, some of the, the bacteria that first colonize your gut as an infant produce short-chain fatty acids, butyric acid in particular, and that's a, a metabolite that your body can't produce. It has to be produced by the bacteria. That, if you don't have those bacteria that make butyric acid, you become skewed towards being Th2 prone, to, prone to allergic disease, food allergies, and airway allergies. Um, and we've actually even shown that if you did have uh, high uh, antibiotic treatment, and provide butyric acid in transit, you put it in the drinking water, you can protect mice from allergies. So all that work suggests that what the bacteria you get colonized with early in life can really have a dramatic result, uh, influence on what type of inflammation you get as an adult. It's fascinating work. Okay. And uh, you have worked on cancer too, and there is a link between cancer and inflammation. So how would you connect your work with the cancer, whatever you have done with? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned, we were working on this family of stem cell proteins called the CD34 family. And all of our work says that those proteins make cells more mobile and invasive and help cells migrate um, to the sites of inflammation, but also development. Um, cancer is a mobile and invasive disease. And it turns out that tumor cells have stolen that mechanism in order to be able to migrate and move to different sites within the body. So the protein, the CD34 family member we work on there is called podocolixin. Um, that protein gets upregulated on cancer as they transition from primary tumors to becoming more metastatic tumors. Um, interestingly enough, those proteins have a a whole variety of sugar groups attached to them. Um, and that glycosylation, those sugar attachments, are actually different in cancer than they are in normal cells. Mm -hmm. So our approach has been to make antibodies to that tumor-specific form of protocolixin. We develop some really nice antibodies, and those tend to block cancer progression in mouse models very effectively. And we can take human cells, put them in mice, they form aggressive disease, we inject those antibodies to protoclixin, we can actually prevent metastases in the mice. We're trying to develop that as a therapy. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. You have done a lot of work on different uh, like connect, interconnecting uh, fields, uh, which gives you a fuller story depending on where you want to look at, which will also give you opportunity to dabble into different things simultaneously. It, it's been great. You know, I we find that science is so complex um, and you know, it's good to have hypotheses. And the first time you do an experiment, though, you find 90% of the time your hypothesis was incorrect. But yeah. fortunately, you discover something much more interesting than the thing you were looking for. And yeah. just by being open and following the, where the leads take you, you can learn a lot about disease. Yeah, you need to keep your eyes open always. Exactly. I think so, it was Pasteur who says, you know, uh, uh, opportunity favors, favors the prepared mind. Mind, yeah. So again, uh, Dr. McNagney, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. So you will, I'll send you the link once it is uploaded on the site. So it should happen within the next 24 hours or so. So you can use it to put in your website or anywhere you want to. And uh, your, this will be there on our website. And we will post it on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, everywhere. So hope you don't mind sharing your uh, email address, I guess. So people might want to contact you, learn about it, or like uh, want to 
collaborate with you or whatever mm -hmm. like they want to my pleasure so again thank you so much and uh, have a nice week thank you you as well <laughs>